I'm the co-founder and festival director of Imagine This Women's International Film Festival, and I'd like to, like to introduce you to our fifth annual film festival. Today, we have a fireside chat with writer and director Felicia Pride. Felicia Pride has been a writer for, uh, season, for two seasons of Ava DuVay's Queen Sugar and is currently a writer on Grey's Anatomy. She has sold a feature deeper an erotic romance to Universal Picture with Will Packer production. And she is also the co-writer and executive producer of the film Real, Really Love produced by Macro. Um, I'd like to welcome you and thank you for joining us today. Thank uh, you for having me. Of course, we're, we're so excited to have you. I can't wait to like, you know, tell everyone your story and that you can share your experience with our community. And I'm sure they'll learn They'll definitely learn from your experience. Um, so I'd love to just dive into your origin story. Uh, yeah. You started, can you just walk us through your journey from being a, you know, from writing books to currently writing on television and film? Yeah, so I got my start uh, about 20 years ago as a journalist, um, writing primarily about music and culture and then moved into writing about books and the publishing industry. Um, and it was around that time where I also wanted to write books. Um, so I actually went back to school, got my master's in writing literature and publishing from Emerson College, moved back to New York, worked in New York book publishing, um, and found my way to get an agent and all of that and wrote six books. And after that, I realized that books came really hard to me. Books was like not my thing, even though like, not my thing as a writer. Um, I'm just still an avid reader and, and love books. But for me, it was it, it didn't feel like my form. Um, and so and and I, it was hard for me to sell another book project. So I stopped writing for about seven years and I started a consultancy where I was doing marketing for book publishers and authors. And then that expanded to films and other media projects. I was essentially what we call now impact producer. So I was helping social justice projects to reach audiences. And that work was fulfilling until I um, came to sort of a crossroads in my business and I was burnt out from running around and chasing checks and doing it, doing a lot of it myself. Um, and I was wanting to get back to writing, you know, and I was, so I talked to my mentor. She was like, well, what is it that you wanna do? I was like, you know, I wanna write and create great content for the screen. Like I had started slowly, surely kind of trying to self-teach myself mm -hmm. screenwriting at this point um, to the point that I finished a feature. So she's like, well, why don't you move to the biggest market? And so five years ago, I moved to LA with one feature. Um, that feature became Really Love that Macro produced and that was going to premiere at this most recent South by Southwest. And so I came out here looking to break into writing for film and TV. But when I first got out here, I was working in film distribution Hmm. Um, which was very much a connection with things that I was doing as an impact producer. And I love my work because I love to be in service of the creators. Um, but then I got laid off. And so that, <laughs> but that layoff, even though it was devastating at the time was a blessing in disguise because it got me refocused on why I moved out to LA. And so I like really, really buckled down and got focused and, um, yeah, started to really, really pursue film and TV writing, um, full force and, yeah, that's kind of how I got here. Um, so you got into two programs, uh, two fellowship programs, uh, into the Film Independent Screening Writing Lab Fellow and NBC Writers on the Verge um, Fellowship Program. Can you tell us a little bit how you were able to get into those programs and any advice that you might have for aspiring writers who are looking to get into similar programs? Yeah, so the Film Independent Screenwriting Lab came right on time because it was essentially the September before the October when I got laid off. <laughs> so that September being in that program really helped me to sort of professionalize what I was trying to do. It gave me validation, gave me a little sort of push like, okay, you might be going on the right track. And also allowed me to be around other writers um, who were who are really smart and doing their thing and, and have that space and time to think about craft. Um, and then for the NBC Writers on the Verge, which is essentially a pipeline to help um, emerging TV writers get into the game. You know, I had applied for that program the first year I moved out to LA. I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't know anything about the application process. 
so part of my buckling down was really kind of learning about the industry and the business. And I learned that fellowship season is like a big thing out here because all the major, um, like literally they just made announcements about this year's fellows across all the networks. So like WB has one, HBO has one, ABC, NBC, Fox used to have one, CBS has one. Um, and, and it's a really, really competitive time and a really, really competitive programs. Um, but I learned that there was like things that you can do. Like um, I took a fellowship bio class with Script Anatomy, this place that I took all my television writing classes. And that helped me to really learn about how to craft an essay for these fellowships that make sense. I would attend these panels where people who had got into the programs talked about um, what worked. And then I, I made sure that I wrote a really good spec. So a spec is uh, in TV is a script of an existing show. So I wrote a spec on Atlanta and I took a really, really big swing um, with my spec. Like it was crazy. Like it takes place in purgatory. Hmm. So I did things that would help me stand out. I did things to make sure that I had a cohesive application. Um, and yeah, and then I got in and I got in as a comedy writer. Um, and coming out of that program, one of the things that Karen Horn, who used to run the program, told me, she said, you know, you should write an hour long. I think you can do it. Write a light hour long because there's just more dramas on TV. And that was some of the best advice I could have gotten because that helped me to get land my first um, staff writing. Now, did you go in wanting to write comedy or were you interested in also writing drama, but you just found yourself in the comedy <laughs> consider myself a dramedy writer like okay. in my own stuff like humor is always there um so I I came into the program as a half hour dramedy writer even though that there's that not really distinctions for that with the programs okay. although we're seeing more shows that are dramedies and whatnot in the half hour and the hour long space but that's how I thought of myself because I wasn't like a joke joke jokes on the page writer um so yeah Oh, cool. Uh, can you share us how you got your first writing gig? Or yeah. like any, any little like insight on how you were able to land that job and even like your experience being in the writer's room for the first time? Yeah, so um, I my first writing gig was on Queen Sugar and I got that opportunity very traditionally um, through reps. So I landed reps after selling my feature really love i sold that um unagented without an agent um so that helped to give me a little bit of heat is what i like to call it um so i was able to land an agent because of partly because of that and also being in the um, writers in the verge program um and having tight a, a some samples that agents could respond to i think one of the biggest things that i always tell writers is like make sure your portfolio meaning your samples are tight and ready um and because those are probably the strongest indicator of um well that i would say not the strongest indicator they are like the necessary thing that you need in order to staff in order to get reps etc so i got my reps and then my rep submitted me to Queen Sugar, the showrunner, Anthony Sparks, who's amazing, um, read my work. And then I met with him, had a really, really great meeting. Then I met with Ava, who, you know, is a force. Um, and then I got got on the show. So it was more traditional, very traditional in that way. How was the your experience like the first day that you showed up to work? How was that? And is there like any advice you can give to a newbie? Like, things you shouldn't probably do on your face the first day? Um, you have to, I would say on your first day, definitely try to read the room um, and understand, uh, you know, sort of where each person is coming from. Because if you're new, you're going to be at quote unquote, the lowest rung as a staff writer. Um, so you want to play your position. You want to know what your position is. I though was 38 on my first, you know, I turned 39 in the room. And so even though I was playing my position, I also felt like I had a lot to offer. So I was smart about offering that, you know what I mean? You don't want to do too much. Right. Um, but I also was blessed because, you know, um, Anthony and Ava are 
um, you know, really care about um, diversity, inclusion, and people um, being in the room. And so I felt like my perspective, you know, as a like a 38 year old black woman was really respected and um, considered So I feel like I was really spoiled (laughs) on my first go around because it was just such a great, amazing room. Like Anthony was a really great leader um, and writer. And I felt like every day was a learning. I learned every day. I still feel that way being in writer's rooms. Like it's, I feel like I, I get to learn every day, which is wonderful. But I feel very blessed and spoiled in that way of having such an amazing room on such an amazing show a show that's for for black people made by black people like you know that's rare that is very rare um you mentioned earlier that you sold your first project without a rep how was that process like how did you manage that world yeah um so i was really because i I wrote that script about 10 years ago. So essentially it took me 10 years to get this film made. Um, And first thing that I did was I attached a director. Our director is Angel Christy Williams. She's from Baltimore. We met at like a friend's event um, and we just shared. She wanted to direct a romantic drama. I wrote a romantic drama. And so we just got together and between the two of us, we just really thought about our networks Um, people we knew and we really were focused on trying to get the script into people's hands, people that we knew's hands who might be able to do something with it. Mm -hmm. Um, And that's kind of how we were able to get the meeting at Macro and pitch Macro um, and sell it. That's amazing. I I love hearing stories like that, especially when you're someone like, especially when you don't have the connections yet, but yet you managed to find your way through and because your story it had you had you had backup right you were able to sell a solid story and you got through the door and i love hearing stories like that um yeah, then we're, you know i always be like if you can't go to the front door you know go to the your way <laughs> window like yeah. So. yeah that's amazing uh you're currently writing for Grey's anatomy uh did you you started writing that this year like this early? season, yeah, season this seven. Seven. So how was it during COVID? Like, how, what's the writer's room during COVID like? I mean, they're all different, you know. Um, they're, for the most part, every every room that I've been hearing about, they're Zooming. So you're mm-hmm. on Zoom, um, which is a different experience. I think, you know, the when you're in person, you kind of, there's like a magic that happens in the writer's room when you're all in person and you're kind of bouncing off each other's ideas and energy and all of that. So Zoom is definitely a different experience. Um, but you gotta, you know, you gotta make it work. Like everyone's trying to figure out how to create within this time. And I think, you know, but being creative about it. And I think that a lot, a lot of us as creatives are using our creativity for lack of a better word to do just that you know um but yeah it's it's on zoom <laughs> it's on zoom i feel like everything's on zoom now yeah, uh, <laughs> some sort of, you know video chatting software yeah no oh, amazing um i'd like to shift focus on your production company and your film tender uh can you tell us a little bit about your production company felix and annie and what well, annie and why you felt it was necessary for you to start this production company yeah, so Felix and Annie is named after my parents, um, who are very, in my opinion, dichotomous. And um, so they make up me, <laughs> of course, <laughs> but also like my work is very dichotomous. Um, so it just felt fitting to name my company after them. Um, and the first production out of it was is Tender, a uh, short film that I wrote and directed. And it's my first, sort of my directorial debut. Um, and it tenders on the festival circuit right now and it's doing really, really well. And what's what's really gratifying about tender is one, I told myself that I was not a director. I couldn't mm. see what director like directors did. Um, just all these, you know, lies that we tell ourselves, I really believe them. Um, but then I learned quickly that features is a director's medium and that there are certain stories that I want to tell that I want to be a part of that storytelling from beginning to end, Mm -hmm. from start to finish. And when I say end, all the way down to the credits. And um, for instance, I'm working on a project now called Alameda, a feature film that's inspired by my mother, my sister, and my niece. 
And I was like, who's going to direct this? Like no one, I have to do it. So I have to get my skills up. So I took a bunch of classes. And then when I got to the point where I was ready, I wanted to direct something that was containable and producible and not doing too much, but also that explored a lot of the themes that I, that I um, look at in my work. And so I, these characters, Kiana and, and Lulu and Tender actually are from a pilot that I wrote. Mm. And I just remembered them and I'm like, they're both so much like me. They both are me in so many ways. And I feel like I could tell us a packful but producible story between them. Um, I, what I really loved about the story was that you were able to create this environment that allowed these women to be intimate with themselves. And that's something that we don't get to see at all from Black, like through the lens, we don't see Black women being intimate with themselves, being authentic um, and just, you know, being. Uh, did you, was that something that you felt that you needed to tell? Like, as you were writing this story, you were like, I need to be authentic with myself and be authentic with these characters. Was that something I, that, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think I had the epiphany uh in a right working on another project I'm like oh a lot of my work deals with uh lead characters who are trying to get back to or rediscovering their authentic selves um and that's exactly what I feel like tender is a lot about is like um you have both of these two characters you have Kiana who's a little older who just had major surgery who is very stable um but uh has desires that may have been pushed down or pushed away. Um, and then there's Lulu who's younger, who's, you know, queer, out, proud, um, but maybe not as confident with her career and um, where her life is going. And it's kind of like this conversation between an older self and a younger self. Um, but I, within the context, although of like intimacy emotional intimacy between Black women, um, emotional intimacy with ourselves. Um, so yeah, the, those were some of the things that I was going for in it. What so, like, themes were you exploring with Tender? What are those? Because you mentioned you have these set themes. Did you find yourself always placing those themes within the story? That's what's so funny because it's like, no, I just write and then and then you look back and you realize like, oh, there's always these themes that are present. You know what I mean? Mm. Um, yeah, that's kind of it, it happened just. Yeah, it just happens that way. It's just like the things that you're drawn to, I think, come out in the work, you know, um, I, I sometimes definitely like with another project I just worked on, I was much more intentional with um theme especially for longer pieces I think I definitely have to be more intentional but a lot of times you know just even the idea the way the idea comes together it's based on a theme even if you haven't um identified what that theme is that you that you're typically drawn to in your work you know mm -hmm. things that you just like to explore they usually find themselves and find their way into your work at least for me Oh, that's amazing. Um, how do you decide what to write next? Like, what inspires you? Like, do you wake up in the morning? And you're like, oh, I have this story that I just have to tell. Like, what, what, how do you choose your next story? Yeah, I think it's twofold. I think it, I mean, two, I think it's a few things. One is, is, you know, financial sustainability. Like I choose <laughs> projects based on <laughs> work. Right. Uh, and then in terms of projects that I choose for myself, I definitely have burning stories inside of me and I prioritize them by um, what I believe my ability is to get them made. Um, because I also am very, and I think this is, you know, like the Ava school of thought. I remember at one point she was like, you know, she wanted to make a film a year, like to her taking 10 years to make a film is not sexy and having been gone through the process of 10 years to make a film I believe I agree with her so I think for me it's like always wanting to create something that can be made so I've been prioritizing projects like that in that way so I have like a whole spreadsheet and slate of projects that I want to work on but I tend to prioritize them based on my ability to get them made um so yeah yeah oh nice um do you have like 
what do you do when you're in the middle of a writer's block? Do you have any rituals that help you unblock that block? Yeah, I don't get writer's block. I don't oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> anymore. Anymore. Yeah, I think for me, I think writer's block uh, was a manifestation of fear. Hmm. Um, now I do get to the point where maybe I, I have a writer's puzzle. There's a, something I got to figure out about the story. I got to figure out the story, but I don't get writer's block because I, I guess because I stopped writing for so long that um, I think it's two things. I think for me, it is a, a, a certain um, privilege that I attribute to writing to mm -hmm. be able to write professionally in this way. And then there's also a certain urgency of the amount of stories that I need to tell that, um, yeah, I don't, I don't get blocked. I get, you know, I have, sometimes I'm tired. Mm -hmm. I procrastinate. I definitely can procrastinate, um, but I don't, I'm not blocked. Hmm. Uh, I have a question. Someone wanted to know what advice do you have for someone who has written their first script, feature fifth, uh, feature script. What is the best way to get that film made? Is it the fellowship route, the screenplay competition, or is it labs? Well, they're all kind of similar. Um, and I, I'm not one of those who's like throw everything at the dartboard, right? Um, I think it, features are really hard to get made, <laughs> especially as writers. So I think there's a couple of things you want to think about. Um, how can you attach someone who can make you help you get the project forward? Typically, that's a producer. So, can you find producers who might be interested in this project? A producer who might be interested in this interested in this project. And typically, producers can like get the ball rolling for you. Um, is there a director that maybe you can attach, like I did, and you guys work together to make it happen? Um, networking, getting the script into people's hands. Yes, fellowships, labs, contests, like all everything. Like I even, you know, early on, early, early on, we shot a proof of concept for the film, like everything, <laughs> like literally everything. Hmm. Do you have any, um, cause right now it's crazy and we're all trying to get through this world, you know, this thing called life. Um, do you have any self care rituals that helps you get through your, you know, helps you through your writing process and just helping you stay grounded through all this craziness? Yeah, so when I was uh, in Writers on the Verge, my father died mm -hmm. and it was also a really tough time career wise. And, but I recognized that time as like, oh, like this is, might be how it's gonna be. Like the industry, that's when I really learned the industry was crazy. <laughs> like personally, like I felt it, I experienced it. And then also life was happening, you know? And I was like, oh, this might how it has, this might be how it's going to be um, at certain times. And Felicia, you need to get your tools up. Mm -hmm. So I really went hard on one, a lot of self-work. So I do a lot of self-work and that's journaling. That's listening to podcasts around like mindset and stuff like so I do a lot of self-work I do yoga um like I that was being on the mat really helped me to grieve um so now yoga is a big thing I go hiking every week with my home girl where we vent about the business and then we talk about our weeks and how we're going to manifest I meditate um, like when I say I have to do all of these things to stay grounded because this business is nutty. It's mm. nutty. It's nutty. And then you see how people um, change in ways and mm. that you like, I don't want to be that. Right. Um, so I do a lot of all of that to kind of stay centered, to stay grounded. And another thing that I do um, and this may not be as connected to self-care, but try to be of service as much as possible because that also helps mm. to keep things in perspective and to, to stay grounded. Mm. Do you have uh, any practical advice for writers and filmmakers looking to break into Hollywood? Uh, yeah, I would say, <laughs> the one thing I would say is that like, how I'm thinking about my career right now is like, you know, one step in Hollywood and one step in the indie space making stuff. Like we can't wait on Hollywood to get it because <laughs> they're not, it's not a visionary industry. It, it right. feels like it is, but it's not. 
Um, and a lot of our visions, Hollywood is not ready for. A lot of our persons, who we are, they ain't ready for us. Um, but that shouldn't stop our art. That shouldn't stop the stories that we have to that we have to tell. So I would uh, I would say like find ways if possible to make things. Um, and then in terms of breaking in, you know, one things that I think things that I think are important are craft. So get working on your craft continuously. Like I'm in two writers groups. I took four classes over quarantine. Like I just continue to learn. So always getting better. Mm -hmm. um, networking is really, really important. It's, I know it's sometimes hard for us like bat cave writers, but who you know and your relationships lead to a lot of, op lot of opportunities. Um, so networking, craft, um, and then also producing stuff. And when I say producing, like creating stuff, like continuously writing continuously making, continuously creating. Like, it's not enough to have that one script. Right. You know, it's just not like, I learned that early on. I was like, ooh, I came out here with one script and I said, ooh, that ain't enough. Uh, and also that's not career making, you know what I mean? Like if you want this to be your career, that's not career making. So one thing I try to do is continuously create material because that gives stuff for my reps to do. It also gives me stuff to do if I'm going to be trying to get it made, you know, so those are three things that kind of, I think I, I focus on a lot is the craft, the, the like relationship building, um, and then the work. The work is the most important thing. The work is what, no one can take the work away from you. The work is like the joys in the work. The work is where you'll find the freedom and the creativity and all of that. Um, so I, I'll, I also try to focus on the work. You, you earlier, you mentioned the noise. So I just want to know, like, how do you stay authentic and how do you continue to share black stories? Like, what are some ways, like even pitching it to, you know, non POC heads, how do you say, this is the story I want to tell and I'm going to stay authentic in this story. How, like yeah, any of I, think, I think that's the other thing that if that is what we're going to say, then we also have to be willing to make it outside of Hollywood. So one thing, one way that I stay authentic with certain stories is like for instance, we wanna turn Tender into a feature. Um, we're just gonna raise the money on our own. I'm not going the Hollywood system's way because I want to maintain a certain level of creative integrity and authenticity for that project. So we're gonna make it outside of that. I'm gonna put in some money. I'm gonna find some other people to put in some money and we're gonna make it. Like that, you know, that's that's one way that you stay authentic because sometimes it's really hard to stay authentic when it's someone else giving you money. <laughs> that's right. essentially, you know, if Hollywood's giving you millions of dollars, it can be really challenging to, um, to have to balance all of the things that you have to balance. But then I also think that it's being able to walk away with, from projects when they are not aligning with your vision, being able to say no to projects. Like I, I, um, and also being clear with what you do. Like I am my own, on my own work, right for black people. Right. You know? like, that, everyone knows that in terms right. of like the team and all that I write for black people. So. Yeah. So we, like the last panel I had, I, 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 wanted to know how does everyone use your power and that's your power right knowing that you can walk away from a project or saying no like I don't believe this is the way the character should go like I believe we should stay authentic and so that's great just hearing from all you ladies that you know how to use your power and your power is sometimes saying no so that's just absolutely right. absolutely and like and 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 even <laughs> yes it is absolutely <laughs> in saying no. And then I think to counterbalance that though, is like still finding ways to get our work made. Um, and it might have to be outside of Hollywood. You know what I mean? Thinking of new creative models to get our work made. And then also what I think is important having worked in distribution is also making sure the audiences we intended the, our work to be seen, sees it, you mm -hmm. know what I mean? So like being a part of the marketing and distribution process as much as possible, like, I think sometimes we hand off our babies and they don't do right by our babies. You know what I mean? So like, I think that's also important is us 
if we're not able to do it, bringing on team members who can do it to make sure that our films and our work and our reach the people we intended it to reach the people we're creating for. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah. Yeah. Lastly, um, can you tell us any projects we should be looking out for and ways people can follow you? Yeah. So um, we set up a Patreon for ten the tender feature film, which takes audiences behind the scenes of the development of the feature. So I'm sharing visual inspiration. I'm sharing text. I'm sharing updates, um, all of that. So that's available. And then um, we have a lot of goodies on tendermovie.com, which you can also find the Patreon there. But if you love the music in it, we have a extended playlist put together by the artists behind the music, uh, Asha Santi and Boomscat. Mm -hmm. um, so the tender feature is one project that is definitely on the horizons to look out for. And then also since 2012, I've been running a service called They Create Daily. Mm -hmm. which is a service for underrepresented storytellers. Every week I send a newsletter chock full of resources and opportunities. Um, so that's free. This is just a community service. So you can sign up for that at thecreatedaily.com. And you can follow me on Instagram and Twitter at Felicia Pride. Oh, awesome. Thank you so much. I just want to remind everyone, once we're done, you could head over to itwff2020.eventy.org and you can watch uh, Felicia's film on our platform for free. Um, <laughs> um, so I just want to thank you so much for joining us uh, and sharing any, like all your experiences with us and potentially helping uh, an aspiring film, uh, screenwriter and filmmaker uh, find their path. So I just well, want to thank you for this platform and all the work you're doing to bring us together and to highlight our work and to, it's amazing. I know that it is not an easy feat and it takes a lot of work and sometimes it's very thankless. <laughs> so thank you so much. Well, thank you so much. I want to, uh, I just really appreciate it. Thank you. Take care. Thanks.